Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome to another episode of T4C. I am so glad you press play. My next fascinating guest is proof positive that no matter what you study in college, the sky is the limit for you in your professional life. As you'll hear her explain in just a few minutes, your career path may well consist of a series of pivot points that you will make in order to head in exciting new directions, each time building on existing skills while forging new ones. And so if you're a liberal arts major interested in foreign languages and foreign cultures, don't rule out the possibility you might end up in the world of finance or startups or take on brand marketing and digital strategy or become an angel investor. As I have seen over and over again in my own life, never say never. But before I introduce you to Lisa Shallon, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's our weekly newsletter that gives you an overview of the guests we're going to be featuring that week. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four coffee.org and sign up. And while you're there, I invite you to check out the dozens and dozens of episodes of T4C that most interest you. You can search them by clicking on the career that is most relevant to your interests, and you can see all of the professionals we've interviewed who work in those fields. Now, my friends, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew, because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest today is Lisa Shallon, a retired Goldman Sachs partner who recently decided to return to work full-time in an exciting new role as managing partner and head of strategic innovation at Brookfield Asset Management. Brookfield is a leading global alternative asset manager focused on investing in long-life, high-quality assets across real estate, infrastructure, renewable power, and private equity. During her 20-year career at Goldman Sachs, Lisa held a number of leadership roles, some of which we'll be discussing in this interview, including Global Head of Brand Marketing and Digital Strategy, managing Goldman's brand during the 2008 financial crisis. During her recent so-called retirement, Lisa advised startups, angel invested, and also spent one year on the executive team of a high-growth millennial-led startup, gaining new perspective while applying her large company skills in an early-stage company context. Lisa, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you still caffeinated on life and ready to go? Naturally caffeinated and ready to go. I love it. Lisa, as I mentioned, you have just started a new role at Brookfield Asset Management, but rather than talk about what you're doing now, which frankly would be talking more about the sausage making before there's any sausage, I thought we could flash way back to before you started at Goldman to when you were an undergrad at Harvard. And as I hinted in the introduction, you didn't study finance or accounting or business, right? Correct. So you were an East Asian studies major. Correct. Why did you choose that major? And did you have any idea what you were going to do with that degree when you graduated? You know, I chose that major for very sentimental reasons. So I had an experience that I was so fortunate to have and so clueless about at the time of deciding when I was in high school. I went to a public high school on Long Island. My high school decided to participate in a competition that was going on at that time, whereby two students from each state in the United States were able to compete to be chosen as exchange students. And long story short, I ended up in the summer between my junior and senior years of high school going to Japan and living just outside of Tokyo with a family that spoke no English. I spoke no Japanese. And it was a cross-cultural, phenomenal, eye-opening experience that from that point on 
really changed my life. Having had that experience, when I came home and still had my senior year of high school left, I decided that one day I would learn Japanese and go back and speak with that host family in Japanese and figure out what on earth I had just experienced. <laughs> and I went into college expecting to be an English major and take Japanese. Well, when I started to take Japanese, what happened was it took so much time in my schedule to study Japanese that I had to become an East Asian studies major if I wanted to continue it. And I decided that I did. And it led to a lot of interesting other opportunities for me as a result. So let's skip to some of those interesting opportunities. Did you know what you were going to do when you graduated? And what was your first job out of college? And how did you get it? I really had no idea. And frankly, was so consumed with my studies that I kind of kept my head down. So I got lucky at the middle of my senior year in college because the then head of my department called me one day and he said, you know, there's a very interesting internship that's come across my desk. And I ended up being one of two interns, along with a student from Brown University, who worked in Tokyo for, in my case, a year and a half for a company that at the time in the US wasn't well known, but in Japan was extremely well known. It was a huge media company in Japan called the Fuji Sanke Group. And I ended up working at Fuji Television as an intern on the production side, making Japanese game shows and a home shopping show. And the production unit I chose ended up being the one that was 24-7 at work on what was called edutainment at the time. So education combined with entertainment. So if I didn't know the rest of the story, the rest of Lisa Shallot's bio, I would have said, of course, then you went into television. How did you end up in financial services? Well, as I looked at my peers whom I had graduated uh, you know, college with, I found that some of them were at investment banks doing financial analyst jobs. Some of them were at consulting firms doing things where they seemed to be learning a trade, an approach, a methodology, a skill. And it got to the point where we were almost speaking different languages. And I really wanted to learn business. And there wasn't really a training program other than on-the-job training at Fujisanke that would enable me to learn business. And so at that point, even though I never would have predicted it, I realized I needed to go back and get an MBA. And so I applied to business school. And why were you interested in business? What was it about your classmates and what they were doing that attracted you? You know, I really felt like they knew how to do things, that they were learning skills that would help them be analytical, understand certain contexts, be professional, be able to understand an industry or a strategy, or some of them went right to law school. And so they were learning contexts that I didn't have. So I want to go forward now from when you were working at Fuji Sanke and after you got your MBA at Harvard Business School, you went to work at Goldman. I just want to take one step back and say that right out of business school, I told you that I was not interested in going to Wall Street. And so I wasn't even looking at a Goldman Sachs. And by the way, by the time I got to business school, the Japanese economy had imploded. So my supposed competitive advantage, if anything, had become completely irrelevant. But it was a German media company called Bertelsmann that was perhaps the only company I've ever met that knew the Japanese media company and valued me for that experience. And so right out of business school, I joined Bertelsmann. My interest in joining Bertelsmann was because they wanted to start a business that had done very well in New York, in Japan and wanted me to start that business. And so after a week of being at Bertelsmann, it turns out that it was not legal as a form of marketing to do the business that was so successful and obviously legal in, in the US in Japan. And so that's when I discovered, thanks to a listing in a newsletter at that time in hard copy, that there was this job called Japanese equity sales that lived in 
the equities division of an investment banking uh, firm and would pay me to talk to smart people about Japan all day, value my skills from all of these years of learning Japanese language, culture, and business, and teach me whatever I needed to know about the markets. That is how I stumbled my way onto Wall Street. And I'd like to think, again, particularly because of the work that you're doing in this podcast, that maybe people will be a lot more informed than I was in knowing about the possibilities and ways to apply your skills. I just got lucky and found this job. And that ended up becoming a 20-year career on Wall Street. Thank you so much for clarifying, Lisa. And I think it is a great example of how sometimes false starts will happen in our career or detours will happen. And you'll end up maybe at that moment thinking, oh my God, it's a catastrophe, but there's a way to recover. And you did. And it ended up being one of the great highlights of your professional life, the 20 years that you spent at Goldman Sachs. Yes. Lisa, could you help Java junkies understand what different divisions exist within Goldman? The fact that this is not a one-dimensional firm, that this is 360 degrees with many different colors and textures and opportunities and paths that you can take in your professional life. Sure. I think typically... There are divisions that are considered, and I don't really like these names, revenue divisions, meaning that they are direct client-facing divisions. And then there are divisions that I would call revenue enabling, which are vital functions to enable the people in revenue divisions to generate revenues. And so I, I like to divide it that way because I've been on both sides of that. And all of these functions are vital and part of the value chain of what any investment bank might do to serve a client and differentiate themselves. So typically on the revenue side, there are businesses like the equities division or the equities business in the securities division, the fixed income business, where you're typically serving institutional investors, so mutual funds and hedge funds and pension funds that want to invest in securities products like stocks and bonds and options and various forms of derivatives in order to express a market view or take a position or manage portfolios of assets that they've been entrusted with. There is the investment banking division that is providing all sorts of advisory services to corporates typically, or sometimes to governments, helping them think about how to manage their financial needs as companies, helping to find liquidity and manage their balance sheets, helping to allocate capital, do an initial public offering, all sorts of things related to those advisory and market functions. Then there's the investment management division, which might have a private wealth division in which financial advisors help individuals of all different types of wealth. And then there's an asset management division that might work with companies managing their pension plans or offer mutual funds. At Goldman, there's also a merchant bank that helps invest in uh, portfolios of private companies and generate liquidity or sometimes real estate. So those are businesses that typically are considered on the revenue side. And I'm sure there's one or two I'm forgetting here. And then on the revenue enabling side, are all of the things that help those businesses do their business or help a company run as a company. So that will include everything from operations, so all the processing of trades that clients do, for example, or risk management and managing credit in order to understand how the firm is leveraging its balance sheet or giving credit, compliance and legal and audit, which are called control functions, helping to ensure that the firm follows the rules and manages to do what its regulators want and establish relationships with those regulators. And then there are functions that, for example, sit in the executive office, such as media relations or investor relations, speaking with the firm's investors and stakeholders, or might be things like environment, social governance, and corporate responsibility, 
or might be brand marketing and managing the firm's brand and maybe its website and other things like that. There are so many different and interesting businesses. There's a group that manages the firm's real estate services because obviously any company has to have space. So there are lots of different functions that sometimes, for example, when people think of an investment bank, they only think of a trading floor or investment banking. But there are so many ways to be part of an investment bank. And sometimes opportunities are missed because people don't think of these firms that way. Thank you so much, Lisa. I didn't mean to throw you such a weighty question. And by no means do I expect you to be able to cover the entire waterfront. But I really appreciate you painting the picture of the variety of options that wait for young people who may be interested in having this type of an opportunity. I want to talk with you about the opportunity that presented itself to you. And I say that with air quotes on the eve of the financial crisis, Mm -hmm. when you were tapped to take on the role of global head of brand marketing and digital strategy in the executive office at Goldman. This is less about what you did in the role and more about how you did it. Did you have any background in marketing or digital strategy or was this more of a case of figuring it out on the job? Well, it was definitely the latter. And interestingly, when I took the role, I'm not even sure what the job description was for that role. I just knew that there would be innovation and change involved and that I had to figure it out. But by that point, I was somewhat confident in my ability to be agile and figure things out. What I did not expect and which nobody expected was that Goldman Sachs in particular would become a target at a time when Wall Street was really the source of a lot of blame for the financial crisis. And as a result, I ended up in what was a crisis mode. And what I learned from crisis is that a lot of opportunity comes from crisis. Sometimes it's hard to introduce change when everything's going well. But when you're in a situation where everything is called into question, or the world seems to have turned upside down, that's when, oddly enough, people are open to new ideas and solutions. I really learned that firsthand. But to answer your question more specifically, I did not have a background in what would be called traditional marketing. The interesting thing, and I think it's really characteristic of the times we live in now, but the interesting thing that happened when I was dropped into this role was that even if you were a veteran marketer. You had to learn completely new things. So yes, the financial crisis was going on. Yes, Goldman had its own crisis in the context of that to deal with. But perhaps the most interesting thing was that at that time, it was when social and digital channels, the social media that were surrounded by all the time and, and can't imagine living without, were first emerging. And as a marketer, Whether you were experienced or just dropped into it like me, you had to learn completely new ways of doing things, new channels, new opportunities to communicate, new communications that were coming at you, whether you could control your brand, whether you lost control of your brand, the speed at which life moved when social media became so real time and the ability to measure everything in a way that marketers really had never been able to. So on the one hand, there certainly were things that I called upon very generous mentors in the CMO community, the chief marketing officer community to learn. But we were sitting side by side. And if anything, I had an advantage because I knew nothing. So everything was a clean sheet of paper to me to learn completely new things, mostly from founders who were the ones with startups disrupting Anything that you could consider the marketing, advertising, communicating, and measurement space. Lisa, very quickly, can you give us an example of how you brought yourself up to speed? You just alluded to sitting side by side with CMOs that you knew, but what were you doing to educate yourself and to get to a place where you felt comfortable in making decisions? Well, you know, I knew that 
no one really knew this better than I was going to learn it. It was a completely new skill set for the firm. So in that regard, I felt even more responsible, but a little less judged. I would say that there were a few things that I did. One was I just started to really tune my antenna for information to be very sensitive. So I would spend a lot of time thinking about all the different ways in which Goldman's brand at that time was perceived and by whom. Thinking about different stakeholder groups, thinking about all the ways I had information about how Goldman was being talked about or perceived. And I really dialed up my monitoring skills and my surface area for observing and learning that. So that was one. I spent time, of course, with veteran marketers, with brilliant people in the advertising business, and some of my colleagues who preceded me and were part of my team who actually did have a background in marketing, thankfully. I also made sure to allocate time to talk with founders, all of these startup founders who were bringing new ideas to the space because there was so much that was changing. I knew they were going to be on the forefront of change. And then I also spent a lot of time within my organization helping to kind of educate and evangelize this frontier of what was changing about the way people communicate and how that affected our brand and learn from them what their concerns and pain points, places of fear and visions for and wish lists for what a better outcome would be. Great. Thank you so much. There's so much more I could ask you about that, but there is also so much more I still want to ask you about other aspects of your professional life. One of them is the decision that you made in 2015, which was to quit Goldman after 20 years to reset. I think you may have actually initially used the word retire. Why did you decide to step away? And what opportunities came your way, Lisa, as a result of breaking ties with the firm that you essentially grew up in? You know, I think that as this listening audience will keep experiencing different life milestones, it's important to reflect on what kind of life do I want to be living? What kind of options do I have? Am I happy? Because it's so easy to get consumed by the flow of being busy and feeling productive and making a contribution that sometimes you have to pick your head up and make sure that you're you're thinking about all the portfolio of things and people and relationships that are in your life. And so I say that because at that moment in time, I was thinking about my two sons who one at the time was a sophomore in high school and the other was, I think, an eighth grader. And because I was in such crisis mode and because I tend to be a kind of person who really throws myself into what I do, I realized that I wanted to be spending more time with them and I couldn't really dial it down. I know about myself that I'm kind of an all-in or an asleep person. And I didn't see a way to spend more time at home while still being the kind of performer at Goldman that I wanted to be. I'm sure there would have been a way to do it. It just wasn't a way that I could navigate for myself. And I had a life event, which was unexpectedly, my father passed away. He fell off a ladder and never regain consciousness. I share this because we will all have life moments and hopefully more of them will be joyful than sad. But of course, we're going to have unexpected sad moments. And those moments make you pause. They make you think, wait a second, I need to slow down. I need to pick my head up. I need to evaluate the life I'm leading, the legacy I want to leave the relationships that I want to have. And so I guess the silver lining from that experience was that I hit pause and shifted around my schedule so that my priority was to be home in time for dinner. By day, I would go into the city and spend time with founders and met a lot of founders and tried to be helpful to startups. But by night, religiously, I was home in time for dinner. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lisa. And obviously, I'm so sorry for your loss and the experience that you and your family had with your father's passing. And I completely agree with you. It's so important for us to talk about those 
ups and downs in our life because whether we like it or not, it is a fact of life. One of the things that I would like to ask you about, Lisa, and I try to ask all of my time for coffee guests is whether they would share a story in which they struggled professionally. And it would be very easy for anyone looking at your incredible CV and the story of your professional life, Lisa, and think that it was a series of one amazing experience after another. You did share the experience at the German company, which was not what you had expected. But is there another story in which you hit a roadblock, maybe you were in over your head or had a challenging supervisor or difficult colleagues or something. And most importantly, how you came through the other side. So there are so many stories that I could tell. I'll tell you two quick ones, if that's okay, because there are different times in my career, but I hope that they are helpful to share. So when I was an associate on the Japanese equity sales desk in New York, the Japan desk was small, the trading floor was vast, and it was mostly focused on US shares, the US markets business. And so there was that being a small desk in a big football field size of a room, which revolved on its own axis. But I had some tough clients. And because when I was in New York, when I was reaching out to them, the Japanese market was closed because the Japanese market would be active during our nighttime. When you're in New York, there was no urgency at all for any clients to respond to my call. And how do you create urgency? There was this one client that it took me a year to actually speak live to. And every day I would leave a voicemail for this client, not even speak live, leave a voicemail. The voicemail was limited to 60 seconds. You could re-record it if you screwed up and inevitably got cut off mid-sentence. But I had to find a way to succeed with this client. It was very important for me to build a relationship with this client. And that was made clear to me. And it was something that was a personal goal. And so every day I would come in and try to leave the perfect 60-second voicemail for this client, not knowing whether the client listened to that voicemail, if it went into deep space, or whether there was ever going to be a return on that investment. And let me tell you, 60 seconds is not a long period of time for a voicemail. So the challenge would be I'd have to try to leave the voicemail and inevitably get beeped in the middle of it and have to re-record it. It became the laughing stock of my desk in a very supportive way. But it was hilarious that I was trying to do this every day and it would take me a while to do it. And that was tough. It was tough to find the determination to come in and do that every day. I felt like an idiot. But you know what? In a year, it maybe the client timed it to see if I'd last a year. But literally a year to the day, that client picked up the phone. I didn't even know what to do. <laughs> I, I didn't believe it. I was leaving my voicemail. And then the person said, and that sounds very interesting, Lisa. And I, I froze. I, I almost didn't know what to do. I thought it was a joke. Someone was playing a joke. But that became a very valuable relationship after that. And it taught me a lot. But going through that, I mean, I definitely had my lows wondering whether I had chosen the right profession, wondering whether this was a waste of my time. And lo and behold, it worked out. I would say the other thing is that as I've been in these roles where I've dropped into situations where I don't know anything, where I'm surrounded by subject matter experts who know more than me and who know they know more than me, or where there's something that I need to do to drive change, often these roles can be very lonely. You're bringing new things. Sometimes people don't want to change. They know more than you. How do you overcome the loneliness and a really profound sense of ownership of the risk of doing anything, assuming you can even make the change happen. And I found ways to believe in the mission. I found ways to challenge myself to see things from others' perspectives so that I could win them over and get their buy-in. But believe me, there were many days where I just felt really on my own, even as part of a team, because I was trying to drive new things. And you learn a lot from those experiences, but they're not necessarily always fun. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing those, Lisa. It reminds me of the other Asian country that you and I share. I should say just being in Asia was the experience that I had living in China and learning about the Chinese culture and the importance of knowing how to eat bitterness. And if you can grit it out, you will get to that better place. But you have to develop that tough skin and determination and just put your head down and muscle your way through those difficult times. Lisa, final time for coffee question. If you could go back to Harvard and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? I wish I had met more people found great mentors, developed relationships with professors, and really understood how important it was to have a discipline around just meeting people and taking advantage of the phenomenal environment that college is. There are companies coming on campus all the time. There are interesting speakers. There are people to meet. And then there are your peers. Seek it out and increase the surface area of learning. I think now, you know, I would have realized what a candy store that was, and I would have done even more to find the cookies, the brownies, and the lollipops. (laughs) You're making me hungry. Lisa, honestly, I wish I had five hours that we could spend talking and gleaning so many of the amazing experiences and the wisdom that you have gained from such a varied and interesting professional life that you have led. I want to thank you sincerely for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. I wish you incredible success and professional fulfillment in your new role as the managing partner and head of strategic innovation at Brookfield Asset Management. And thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for this opportunity. And I am so inspired by what you are doing with this podcast. I truly appreciate being a part of it. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.